before we get started, I have a good, uh, good joke for you. Hey, oh, okay. I stopped by my local Ford dealership this morning to look at it. This is kind of apropos for the time we're in. To look for a new truck, I saw a nice F-350 crew cab loaded with all the options that I liked, and I asked to take it for a test drive. A salesperson, a lady wearing a Hillary for President lapel pin, sat in the passenger seat next to me, describing the truck and its options. She explained that the electric seats were connected to the ventilation system. It could be set to blow direct cool air to your butt in the summer and warm air in your butt in the winter. <laughs> so I mentioned that this must be a Trump truck. She looked at me a bit angry and asked why I thought it was a Trump truck. I told her that if it were a Hillary truck, the seats would just blow smoke up my butt all year round. <laughs> <clears throat> The two-mile walk back to the dealership was worth it. <laughs> For some, uh, I guess I know my crowd this morning. You're going to love this message. Um, and lastly, want to know who loves you more? Put your spouse and your dog into the trunk of your car and drive around for an hour. When you open the trunk, see who's happy to see you. <laughs> Yeah, that's, I don't suggest you do that. All right. Glory to God. Well, uh, today is beginning. Well, let's pray first. Let's repent for those jokes and pray. Lord, we love you and we thank you for this day. We give you praise and glory and honor in advance. As always, Holy Spirit, we ask you to rule and reign that, you're, that what's best would come out for this group of people, uh, that you would... Uh, use lips of clay to bring forth words of wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Lately, I, have, um, I haven't really said a whole lot this year about the election yet, and uh, I'm going to say some things today. For the next three weeks, I'm supposed to be talking about God and our nation or something like that. And uh, I, I, well, let me first say, I started... Uh, about six or seven months ago, I went and had coffee with Jeremy White over at uh, Stonewater. And so every couple of weeks, we just started having coffee together, just loving on each other and, and getting to know each other. And because whether you know it or not, there's a lot of pastors that don't like each other. And they just don't get along very well. Um, and it's a shame because every, every pastor that preaches Jesus ought to be able to get along at least on that point. And um, so I'm going to show you some pictures and uh, show you the guys that I've begun to get, get to know. So go ahead and put the first one up. This is Mike Korb. Mike Korb is a pastor at Granbury Baptist uh, out on Highway 51. First, Granbury First Baptist, or First Baptist to Granbury. I don't know. He's out there on 51. And Mike is a really good guy. He took over that church about three years ago, and he has just begun to level off after a long uphill battle with some people, some rebellious people in his church. He's a really good guy. Uh, go ahead and go to the next one. Now, I didn't explain to you, Jeremy and I, uh, we'll just pause on Pastor Allen. Um, I went to him one day and I said, Jeremy, I really, why can't at least the pastors in our town get along? Let's figure something out. And he said, well, what about, uh, he said, that usually the things that get most people off are the spirit of competition. And, uh, and one other thing, I can't remember it. it, may have been arrogance, I don't know, but because uh, there's some pastors that fit that. But um, we met and we said, well, we're going to invite uh, two people each that we trust that would be like to come together. And all we do is talk about relationship stuff. We don't have agendas. We don't try to change the world. We're just trying to get to know each other. And because when you get to know somebody, you can get in unity with them. It's hard to be in unity with people that you don't know. And so uh, this is Pastor Allen, and he's been coming. He is hilarious, and he is awesome. And uh, he called me this morning, and he said, how are you, or yesterday, how are you doing on that message? And I said, I have no idea. How are you doing? I said, I'm the same. And so he's just like, how do I do this? And, but he came up with some really cool stuff. And oh, <laughs> that's me and Bruce Lee. So go to the next one. Go to the next one. Go to the next one, quick. Okay, this is Quentin Wells. Quentin Wells pastors the Red Door Church 
in Crescent. And he, he ministers to a lot of people that are coming off drugs and stuff like that. He does a lot of celebrate recovery stuff. He's a great, great guy. Next. This is Paul Duncan. Paul Duncan is a pastor at Mambrano Baptist Church. And uh, just a real sweet guy. He's a great, great pastor. Been there a few years. Go to the next one. Oh, that's me and my best friend. Uh, go to the next one. <laughs> okay, this is, we did this already, didn't we? Tim Pixler? Oh, I didn't tell you. Uh, Tim uh, is a, he is an ex-UPC, hardline UPC, UPC pastor. And uh, he just is so full of love now, it's crazy. And so he kind of parted from that denomination and just has a church that loves people. Uh, he's at Cornerstone out in OTS, and uh, he ministers to that community very, very well. Next. This is Jeremy White, if you've never seen him. Jeremy is a, he's a great guy. He's a humble guy. I love being around him. And it's him there on his property in, down in Glen Rose. They have like 400 acres. He raises cattle and then raises people on the side. So anyway, he's an awesome guy. And what we're doing, this T-shirt you see him on he, have on, he has on, is something that we're doing right now. It's called One Nation Under God, and it's in Hood County. And uh, you can go to the, the last one's just me, I think, a real picture. Yeah, just me and Trent. Now you can go, go, go up to our graphic. will be just fine. Thank God for our media team, right? Okay. So part of the agreement of One Nation Under God was that for three weeks we fast, pray, and I talk about America. And I was disappointed that I'd said yes because I never know what I'm going to talk about. Um, and, but I did get something, and I'm going to give you that message next week. It's called uh, God's Government is Family. But this week I'm just going to talk, just talk things that Holy Spirit's given me or that I, I believe I need to say. But what's really cool is that us seven guys are in unity. Amen. We come together. We love each other. We talk each other through hard times. If, if you're not aware, pastors do have hard times. They don't just work 45 minutes a week or a couple of times in my case, or an hour in my case. That would be better said. But there's a lot that goes on during the week. You deal with a lot of people. You deal with a lot of situations. You have to be aware of financial things in the church, all kinds of stuff. And so it's nice being around other pastors that are in agreement with you for success. Well, when Jeremy, he had the idea of One Nation Under God, he took it to the pastoral council, and he told them, look, I don't want to lead it. I don't want to be on stage or anything like that. I just want you to take it, give it to the other pastors, and see what we can do. And so at this point in time, we have 30-plus churches in Hood County participating in this. That is awesome. Now, and that's 30 churches of all different faiths, all different faiths. And we... Uh, and we're excited about it. There's only like 50-something churches in Granbury right around that. So this is almost, this is more than half. Now, that's amazing. And they're all coming together on November 6th, Shanley Park, 6 o'clock at night, to pray. We're just going to pray for about an hour, hour and 15 minutes for the state of our country, for the success of our country. And so I'm, I'm excited about it. I think it's going to be a great, I think it's going to move some things that we're going to, that we're going to call out to God and he is going to hear us, going to hear us. And, um, so we got three weeks of the teaching, three weeks of prayer and fasting. I encourage you to fast something for the next three weeks, starting tomorrow. It doesn't have to, if you've never fasted before, don't say I'm going to fast food and water for three weeks. It won't work. Just trust me. Um, it's, it's a, that's a tougher one, but it, you could fast Facebook. Or you could fast donuts or whatever a big thing is for you, you know, and use that time just to go to God. And I'm not saying you got to spend an hour in prayer, but just throughout the day, you just need to thank God that we live in a great nation. That would just be a really good start because most of the time people are griping about our nation rather than thanking God that we live here. And uh, we really need to be thankful that we live here. And, uh, and then at the end of that times when the prayer rally comes together at Shanley Park. And um, so it's going to be awesome. So right now we have 30 plus churches teaching similar messages. That is really, really cool. That's, that's the potential to have thousands upon thousands of people hearing similar things, seeing the same thing, hearing the same scripture. That's awesome. Now I want you to go to 2 Chronicles 7. And I'm going to start in verse 12. 
And I'm going to read out of the Tree of Life version. It's really good. I'd encourage you to get this. It's only a few bucks on Amazon. But it makes the Bible personal in that it replaces God, the word God, which some of you probably don't know this, that the word God is actually a German derivative of the word Gott, which means higher being. And so they put it in the Bible, but God has a name. He has a lot of different names. And so what the Tree of Life Bible does is it replaces all that, all those generalized names with personal names of God. It's really cool. And for Jesus, call him Yeshua and stuff like that. So in uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 12, so yours won't read exactly like mine, but you'll get the message. Then Adonai, who is God, appeared to Solomon at night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself for a house of sacrifice. If I shut up, and this is verse 13, a lot of people don't read the verses prior to verse 14, which is if my people who call by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, I will hear them and I will heal, heal their land. And they, everybody gets excited, but there's more to the scripture in the context of this than just that scripture. And he goes in and says, if I shut up heaven that there is no rain, or if I, if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, win my people. And so God had already set up a plan that when, he, and the only reason that pestilence and famine and all that stuff came was because of the disobedience of Israel. And so God had set up a plan in place and said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, because I'm going to tell you a pride filled prayer will get you nowhere. God hates pride. But when we humble ourselves and we pray and we seek God's face, we cry out to him. It goes on to say, if my people, my people over, now let me read this to you because it's, it's really cool. When my people over whom my name is called, you are the people over whom his name is called. Yeah. Over whom my name is called, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Amen. You know, it's our humility in, in faith-filled prayer that draws the healing of heaven for our land. And we're talking about our land today because too often times we take God just for me. He, he's helping me. He's helping me get through this or he's meeting my needs and he's doing all this. But we have got to get out of the my, me mindset and get into the our mindset. When Jesus told the guys how to pray, he said, pray like this, our father, not my father. Our Father, wise community. And that's what we're talking about next week. But he goes on to say in verse 15, Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer offered in this place. For now I have chosen and consecrated this house so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. Man, that's a good scripture. But there's some things we got to do. There's, you know, God's a contingent God. He's a contingency-based God. There are things we had. Now, there's no contingency to receive the love of Jesus and be saved. And I know this is Old Testament, but Old Testament's still good. And this is a great prayer. And I believe this is a scripture for our land today. Amen. It's time for Christians to wake up, get out of their slumber, and do something. To not go along and get along with the ways of the world and everything that's going on, but to stand up and say, I am a child of God. I do believe in Jesus Christ. And no matter what anybody does to me, I will stand for whose I am. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. It's time we stand up. Years ago, I talked about, ever since I started the church, I talked about elections. I've told people who to vote for. Well, you, you can get in trouble with the IRS over that. I don't care. Actually, it's, that's debunked. That was a lie. I can say whatever I want. And I'm not saying that pridefully or to say uh, beat my chest or anything like that, but I'm telling you, if pastors and ministers in America will stand in their pulpits and preach the truth about the state of our nation and the requirements of Christianity to see our nation go right, our nation will turn around. But so many times they just sit back and they don't want to ruffle feathers and they don't want anybody to run off from their church and they're scared of the numbers dropping, the offerings dropping or anything else. And people, and you know what? If you're scared of it, it's going to happen. Yeah. I've decided I'm, I ain't scared. I don't like the, you remember the no fear stickers? I like the redneck one. I ain't scared. 
because I'm not scared. I wrote something in between services, and I'm going to get back to that scripture. I read that first to make this a legal service because it's probably the only scripture I'm reading. The rest is going to be some kind of something. When people no longer have to pay a price for their freedom, the freedom they neglect becomes less valuable. We're in a state and time in America right now where people don't value the freedom they experience. I guarantee you, if Colin Kaepernick valued his freedom, he would be standing up with his hand on his heart. Not sitting down and acting like a fool and having other people follow in his footsteps. Because there's too many people that have bled red blood and died overseas so he could sit down and in that he should not. He should have been fired a long time ago. He should have any bonuses stripped from him. It's ridiculous that the NFL says, well, we just got to let people do. No, this is America. And it's about time Americans act like Americans. And it's not, you know, I know the Lee Greenwood song, I'm proud to be an American. And I, I like that song. But I'm not proud to be an American. I am honored to be a Christian. That should be our cry. That should be our flag. And we live in a nation that on its worst day, worst day, Hillary gets in president. She appoints Supreme Court people that are more interested in their opinion and their movement than interpreting the Constitution. And things go south. We're still in our worst day better off than every other nation in the world. There's nations in the world that can't do what we're doing right now. They can't assemble in China. You, it's under threat of your life to get together. They have an underground church. But you know what? The underground church is thriving. It is growing by thousands and thousands and thousands. Why? Because Christianity is persecuted. Maybe it's going to take some persecution of Jesus for us to grow like crazy. But what price are you willing to pay? What price am I willing to pay? I thought, there's so much at stake in this election. And I'm so tired of, and this, this all kind of got started, because I, I don't get on Facebook. I mean, in fact, I deleted it off my phone, and then I, I needed to see something, and I got back on and had messages and all this other stuff. And a friend of mine named Ken Williams up in Bethel Church in Reading posted something, really intelligent post, about how we need to look beyond the man in our voting. We need to look beyond the ignorance of an individual or the stupidity of an individual and the things that they say and do to see what is the guiding light for the way we want to live. Guys, our Second Amendment is at stake. The right to bear arms. And I'm not, nobody's taking my guns. And it's not that I'm, you know, again, beating my chest. That's, that's our, those are our rights. Those were given to us by our founding fathers. And there is a liberal left that wants to take these things away. They want us to become very communistic, very socialistic. I'm telling you, there is no freedom in socialism. There is no freedom in free health care. You see how that's worked out. I mean, even Bill Clinton says it's a mess. Democrats are fine. I mean, even the New York Times, the most liberal paper out there, paper out there said, boy, Obamacare really needs an overhaul. You know what, it's just, it's just, but I look at these things and I think, the only way this has gotten this way is because Christians said nothing, is because the church sat back and was more interested in their exemption than standing up and saying what was right. He posted this article, this thing, and I just got, I've promised Amy I'm trying not, I will try not to get mad while I talk. And so I'm telling you for the next few weeks, and I'm not, I'm not mad at anybody here. I am, I will say, I am mad with our country. I am angry. Friday night, I couldn't go to sleep. I read something, um, I was lo- looking at Fox News, and I just, I have to, I got to stop. <laughs> Because there's, there's, no, there's no news actually about an election. It's all about what people said or did 15 or 20 years ago. Now, granted, when we have an election 
and we have two apparent candidates that are not following Jesus. It's the truth, because you'll know them by their fruit. Even the person I'm voting for, Donald Trump, does not appear to be following Jesus right now. But I'm not voting for a pastor, I'm voting for a president. I want somebody that's going to be able to take our nation, put justices in place. And this, this, you got, people think, well, I'm not voting for Donald Trump because he did that 11 years ago and, and he said that bad thing. I want to know what you said. Yeah. <laughs> At least Donald Trump doesn't have a, lie, a, a wake of dead bodies behind him. Yeah. I lived in Arkansas when Bill and Hillary were in charge. And they used the governor's mansion as a brothel and a place for personal gain. They had state, I'll tell you, I'll, I didn't say this last service, but I'm going to say it. State troopers were appointed outside Hillary Clinton's room so she couldn't get out while Bill had people come in. Had people come in. This is not what we want. I think of the young women in the White House, that if Bill and Hillary Clinton get in, will be damaged because of Bill Clinton. So what I am praying for is that I don't. I think I totally think Bill and Hillary Clinton, Obama and Michelle uh, Obama. No, what's her name? Barack. Barack Hussein Obama. Are we streaming? Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> Streaming's either going to be a really good thing or it's going to be a really bad thing. You're going to get a lot of emails. But anyway, I, uh, this is what I prayed when I was about to go to bed. Uh, Amy was at the retreat with the ladies and stuff, and, and I, I probably was going to bed early because I, I do. And, um, but my heart was so hurt for America. And I said, God, I don't really know what to pray, but I do know I love my nation. I love the people in my nation. I love the soldiers that are fighting for our freedom right now. I love those people that are at death's door trying to keep back the evil. And um, I said, I just want to ask that someone with a Smith Wigglesworth anointing, a John Wesley anointing, will pass, and it could be an accident, Father, but it won't be an accident to you, pass the, cross the path of Bill and Hillary Clinton and Barack and Michelle Obama. So much so that that anointing is so thick they must fall on their face and repent to you for the way that they've dealt with America. We need to be praying that anointed people cross their paths and lead them to Jesus. That's the best thing. We don't just need to pray through the election. We need to pray far beyond that because there are a lot of things set in motion now. A lot of things we don't even know about that it went in under. There was the Affordable Care Act, I'm, I, if I'm getting it right, is more like 3,000 pages long and has so many things in it that don't even have to do with health care. But it got passed because it was under that flag. The last, in between the time that a, a president is elected and he actually goes into office, there's 72 days. And during that 72 days, a lot can happen because there's still a president in power. We gotta be praying all the way through, man. I've already decided I'm, I'm going to pray often. I'm going to pray for the salvation of all of them. Yes. Amen. But I'm especially going to pray for a God encounter with the person that leads our nation. Yes. Whether it's Donald Trump or whether it's Hillary Clinton. And I want to say this. I want to make this abundantly clear. No matter who is elected and, and something else you need to pray for are real elections not covered up elections, not dead people voting. They've already uncovered some stuff. We need to pray and believe 
you know what I'm believing for is that I am believing Donald Trump will win because he has a good running mate. He has a godly man running with him, Mike Pence. I listened to something, and he was quoting this very scripture yesterday. And I thought, man, that's really interesting. And I know that Donald Trump's getting good advice. James Robinson has been to talk to him. James Robinson is a very powerful man, just really has a lot of influence, has, that, has a really interesting anointing on his life. But I'm believing that he's going to listen. We just need to be praying that Donald Trump's ears are open, open to hear the truth. You know, after all this stuff come out, I, I said, I told Amy, I said, if he would just go before the nation and say, I messed up, that was me, I did do that, I was wrong, and I'm asking for your forgiveness. I'm repenting before the American people and God because I was wrong, but help me make this America, America great again. I mean, how far would that go with Christians in the United States? So, prayer works. Faith-filled prayer works. <clears throat> I was watching that night that I went to bed. I told you what I prayed. Before I went to bed, I watched a movie. And I, I think everybody ought to watch this movie. I don't, I'm not, I don't often recommend movies. Uh, but I like historical ones. And this was, it was called Free State of Jones. It was, had Matthew McConaughey in it. He was a lead actor. And then they had a bunch of other people. And if you, I think that we're probably in one of the most racially divided times in our nation. Not just, not just black and white. That may be what's on the news every day. But if you just rely on what the news is telling you, you're getting a limited view of the state of our nation. I found something that was an interview with a bunch of, uh, a lot of Asian people. And I couldn't believe that in 2016, things were being said to them as bad as they were. Some of them were in a, in a subway, a young man sitting there and somebody yelling at him, go cook my effing Chinese food. It's ridiculous. Some ask a young, a young girl was asked, is your peripheral vision better? You know, because of your eyes. And the list goes on and on and on, it's crazy. I thank God that these never, things never even entered my mind, and I was so surprised they were in other people's. But they are. See, Satan is not interested in anything but division, because division brings weakness. If the world, if the church, see, not, the, not the world, but if the church was united like it should be, some of these things would never have happened. When those people, you know, on the, on the bus, I guarantee you there was one or two good people when those things were said. You may have heard things like that said before. It's time we stand up and say no more. No more because it's wrong. Because that's not love. We got to stand up and stand for the love that we say we hold so dear. And quit being so quiet about it and be open about it. Now I know our church, I'm preaching to the choir. I know a lot of you in your daily lives and businesses, you proclaim the name of Jesus. And I'm so honored to be among such great people. Yeah. I am so honored. But we got to tell other people. Yes. Yes. When we see stuff like that happen on Facebook, if you're on Facebook a lot, and you see somebody starting being derided because the, you know, of a leftist agenda, get on there and say, this isn't true. Do something. Yes. Now, I don't advocate getting into a long back and forth on Facebook. It's foolish. But to say nothing is terrible. You know, evil prevails when good men do nothing. And I saw this movie, and uh, it's about the Civil War, the end of the Civil War, and a guy that led a revolution within Mississippi to see that every man was treated the same. That every man had a vote, that every man had a right to speak. And you know, during the late 1800s, uh, slavery was ripe in our nation. And I won't sit here and say that it was all America, but America had a hand in it. A lot of it came from Africa. A lot of it, I mean, there's been slavery across this world ever since the foundation of this world, yeah. since men left Jesus, since Adam and Eve said no, since they tried their own way. But as it was going on in the movie, 
there was a couple of things that were said that I thought were so good. Um, at one point in time, the guy's name was Newton Knight, and he was a, and he, he was a real guy, and he, he led, uh, he established the free state of Jones where all men are equal. And it was within, a, it was a county in Mississippi. And you know, Mississippi was in the, under the Mason-Dixon line. Yeah. <laughs> I came from Arkansas, I was born in Arkansas. It was under the Mason-Dixon line. Yeah. And so is Granberry. I'm telling you, anytime we see something, we need to stand up. If we are brothers in Christ, we do not sit by idly and watch another brother suffer. I don't care what their color is. And I want to tell you something else. We're a race. Christians are a race. You become a new creation in Christ Jesus. Did you know that actually means you're a new race in him? We're being persecuted right now, too. Our religious liberty is at stake. Our borders are at stake. Did you know that, that there's walls in the Bible? There were walls around things. It was to keep the good in and the bad out. Now, I'm not saying every person trying to get in is a bad person. But I do agree. We need to know who's coming in our country. And if you don't like it, Colin Kaepernick or whoever the heck, heck else doesn't like it, just leave. Yeah. Just go to another one. Yeah. See how well you're treated. Yeah. I just, I, you know, I don't do this very often. I'm just, I'm just tired of it. Yeah. And I don't have like this huge platform where thousands of people are hearing what I'm saying, but there's hundreds. And if I don't say something, then I'm accountable. Amen. Abortion. Guys. Jesus. I heard a message one time. This, this message hadn't gone exactly like the first message, but that's okay. By Willie George. Willie George is an amazing teacher. He's at a church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. A very intelligent researcher. Amen. Hitler killed, I think it's around six to eight million people. And six million Jews and then a lot of other people. Then Stalin was around 50 million. Mao Zedong, who was a, a leader in, was it Japan or China? China. 72 million of his own countrymen. I want to tell you, like heaven has levels, so does hell. And when there is so much blood, so much innocent blood crying out, it must be answered. So each of those people that were responsible will answer for that blood. So what does that say about America? I mean, we have millions upon millions of children that have been snuffed out before they had a chance to breathe. Guys, we got to be praying. This is wrong. This is murder. And one candidate is clearly for it, and one is clearly against it. If nothing else, that is how you vote. And we don't waste our vote on people that came late in the game and act foolish. There's no point. It's wasting your vote. And your vote is a seed. Don't, if, don't anybody say, I'm not voting because I don't believe in either one of them. You do believe in something when you don't vote. You believe your voice doesn't matter, and it does. Again, I'm not trying to offend anybody, but if it happens, it happens. So I was watching this movie, and um, Matthew McConaughey's caught character got caught by a dog. It was being chased because he was a deserter from the Civil War. And he got caught by a dog and chewed up bad on his leg. And he was, he was hastened away to a swamps in Mississippi where the, the cops wouldn't, you know, the, the, the Confederacy wouldn't come to find him because they were too scared of the swamps. He got in there and he was put with a bunch of black men that were, that had escaped slavery. And they were taking care of his leg. And this one guy, his, his name was Moses. He was a great character in the movie. He, and, and Matthew Connor said, is that your given name? Your mama give you that? He said, no, I gave it to myself. Matthew was like, yeah, I like that. And I, I'm getting chill bumps thinking about it. Very few movies moved me. This one did. And uh, it was acted very well. It was very, but anyway, and Moses looked at his leg and says, hmm, huh, you must taste like we do, seeing how that dog got you. <laughs> That's a great line. In that one line was so much said. 
If Tony's not here, but, but Brother Ree or anybody, any other person that's not whatever I am, I don't know what I am not. I think I've got German, English, whatever, and I just can't turn out looking pale. <laughs> at least Mexicans and black people and Chinese people, at least they know where they came from. <laughs> I tell everybody all the time, we're just all different shade of Mexican. <laughs> Mexicans are brown and I'm kind of brown and some people are dark brown and, you know, whatever. And, uh, but if, if, I, if I pull my knife out and I cut both of our hands, we'd bleed the same. Because right. the only thing different about us is the pigment of our skin. Yes. And then the, the last line of the movie that I thought was really good, they, they were, there was this guy, his name was Moses. He ended up getting killed in the movie. It was terrible. It was horrific. But before he did, he, had, he, good, he, he walked miles and miles and miles and miles through Mississippi getting people's names finding their birthdays, their parents' names, so he could register them to vote because the Emancipation Proclamation said that everyone gets a vote. And so he began to steward and champion this cause. And because of that, Ku Klux Klan came in and ended up killing him. And um, towards the end of it, when the, they were finally able to vote, the Confederacy, the Ku Klux Klan, all this was trying to keep them from doing it, scare them out of it. And they walked up or they were getting together and this one guy comes up that had been gone for a while and he said it's election day isn't it and Matthew McConaughey's character said yeah it is and he looked at one of his black brothers and said it'd be a shame it's a shame for an election to be over before we vote and if you think that there aren't forces at work right now to fix this election you're being naive we have precedent and we have power in the word to pray that those who mean destruction for us would be confused and turn on themselves. Yeah. Remember Gideon? Didn't they kill themselves? They turned on themselves. Why? Because Gideon did what was, seemed ludicrous and stupid. But he prayed. And he lit the torches under the clay pots. And they broke them. And the enemies consume themselves. Now, I'm not wishing that people would die. I am hoping and praying for a great amount of confusion in this party. And I want to tell you, the Republican Party needs a good overhaul too. It needs a good overhaul. So, if my people, you're his people, you're called by his name. I love the way this said that. He said, when my people over whom my name is called humble themselves and pray. That's what we're doing. For the next three weeks, we're praying. We're fasting. We're asking God for mercy. We have a great nation. Like I said, on our worst day, it's better we live here than in another nation. But when we don't understand the price and we, are not memor we don't memorialize the price of freedom, we often forget the price it took to get it. Right. We can't do that, guys. We need to be, t I tell my, ch every Memorial Day, every uh, chance I get, I tell Trent about his granddads that died in World War II on the beaches of Normandy. D-Day plus one. L. Wood Tubbs, my father's father, was killed by a landmine. His other two fathers served in the army. I tell Trin that because when he starts thinking, well, this isn't that great, he realizes I have blood in the ground in France that died so I could be free. That's his blood. Well, you're in the kingdom of God. You're bought and paid for with the blood of Jesus Christ. You have blood in the ground for freedom. That blood ran down Jesus' head, down his back, and there was still blood left on the cross. They pierced his side, and blood and water flowed, and it poured out on the ground at the, at the bottom of the cross. That's my blood. That's mine. Everybody look up here. That's mine. That's yours. 
We need to take these things seriously. I know this hasn't been the normal net message, but sometimes we need a wake-up call. We need to realize there's more that we can do. The Bible says in Matthew 18, 19, where two or more are gathered together is touching anything. In my will, it will be done for them. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. We need to pray like we never have before. We shouldn't take for granted and say, well, whatever happens, happens. It's already decided. God's already decided what's going to happen. I don't believe that. I believe he knows what's going to happen. I don't believe it is necessarily. I think that we help influence sovereignty by what we do, by our actions. We have a choice. The greatest gift God ever gave man was the ability to choose. Bless God. Well, let me tell you a testimony before we close, because it's really good. And um, I was talking to Pastor Allen yesterday, and he says, you want to hear a testimony? I said, absolutely. I mean, anything good. And you know, it's amazing to me, we don't see these things in the news. (laughs) But this is going to rock your boat. He had a gentleman in his church, he's about 60 years old, and... um, Alan's kind of relaying that he was kind of a contrary guy, kind of funny and stuff. But guy calls him and says, Pastor Alan, guess what? And he says, well, I don't know. Tell me. He said, well, today I was on my way to the dentist, and he had bad teeth. Now, I say bad. It was bad. Infections. The whole, whole mouth needed to come out. It was bad. And he said, I got to the dentist, and guess what? And Alan said, what? He said, my teeth are perfect. I don't have any cavities. I don't have any infections. My teeth are all healed. Isn't that cool? Praise God, man. Pastor Allen's thanking God with him and everything. And then a couple of days later, the lady calls, and it was, uh, it was at Kyle, some of you know Kyle Rogers. It was at his dentist office. And uh, the guy, the, somebody calls him a, a few days later from the dentist office and said, hey, I've got your medication for, the, for this and that. They didn't know that he was healed. And he said, well, I don't need that. I've been healed. And they said, what? He said, yeah, God healed my mouth. I don't even have a cavity. And he said, they said, are you kidding me? And she, he said, no, I'm not kidding you. And he said, she started, they started talking. She said, okay, well, I got to get off the phone. I got to get home to my kids. They're both sick and this and that. He said, well, wait, wait, wait. Let me pray for them. And she said, well, okay, pray for him. He prayed for these kids, just a simple prayer. She got home, both her kids were healed. (laughs) Isn't that awesome? It gets better. This is a big one, what I'm about to tell you. Huge. Somehow we discount what I'm about to say with that God can't do it, but he can do anything. This guy had been coming to church, and he was in the early stages of dementia, Forgetting things, cognitive things weren't working, muscle reflex wasn't working like it was. And he would be in church and always tell Pastor Allen, he would say, yeah, <laughs> I'm just going to die stupid. <laughs> he said, I've just decided, you know, it, it is what it is. I'm just going to die stupid. <laughs> and Pastor Allen would say, don't say that. Quit it. Don't say that around me. And uh, Pastor Allen said, so I didn't, I didn't know that the whole time he was at home, he was on his face before God, saying, God, give me my mind back. God, give me my brain. God, I, I want to be healed. I want to be healed. And one day he was sitting in his chair, and one of his grandkids came in. And I don't know how it happened, but they tossed a, a baseball at him. <laughs> and, and you know what he did? <laughs> he caught it. And he went, Whoa! I caught it. He threw it down and said, throw me another one. <laughs> threw him another one. He caught it. Whoa, throw me another one. Then he took the three balls and started juggling. These are things he used to do before the dementia set in. Now the guy is getting sports injuries because he's out doing sports again. <laughs> he's 60 plus years old. No one's got to lose their mind. Dementia is under the name of Jesus. All you got to do is pray and believe. (coughs) Praise God. 
If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, I will hear their voice from heaven. I will make heaven invade earth. And I will heal their land and their people. We need that. Everybody stand up.